So why do we get cancers? Not quite sure, but if you had to pick something, this would sort of cover almost everything. If I knew I cancer, I would be a multi-billionaire. But <laughs> that's, the, that's the problem that's there, because you find one thing, there's 20 more things that happens down track. Um, and the problem is that you take a biopsy from one part of the breast, but it may not be the same in the other part of the breast. So within a tumor, you might be multiple clones, and that's the problem. Um, just in terms of the type of cancer, you always get all these things thrown at you. So if you think of... Um, if you think of this being DCIS, which is ductal cancer in situ, which is, it's not cancer right now, but it'll become cancer at some point of time. It transformed then into a ductal carcinoma. So IDC is invasive ductal carcinoma. Carcinoma is just a fancy word for cancer. Ducts is the ducts. So if you think of a breast, the majority is just fat. There's the lobule that produces milk, and a duct that takes the milk from the lobule to the nipple. So the cancer of the ducts is ductal cancer. Cancer of the lo lobes is lobular cancer, which is the other part. Uh, and that's looking at the three mains or four main subtypes. So there's the triple negative cancers, there's HER2 driven cancers, and there's the cancer that's driven by estrogen, so luminal A and luminal B. And that gives you a sense of what you would use for what. So, you know, how much your chemotherapy or how much blockade. So it gives you a sense of, you know, what benefits what. So three main types. The majority are tend to be driven by estrogen. There's a bit which is HER2 driven, the bit which is triple negative. So the bacilloid is triple negative. Um, so about 50% of people will come up with newly diagnosed breast cancer. And I think about almost a, a, a third to a half of people with early stage ultimately become metastatic disease over time. Um, and I think unfortunately, the majority of time it's considered to be incurable. You can treat it, but you can't get rid of it. So I think the goals are to control disease, improve survival, and keep a better quality of life. Um, and I think the majority of cancers tend to be, I mean, if you look, classify them, so, you know, driven by estrogen, HER2 negative, or estrogen plus HER2, or triple negative, or estrogen progesterone negative and HER2 negative. There's sort of a new category coming out called the low HER2 category, and I'll explain a bit of what happens later. So that, that'll probably change in the next few months. So when you think of treatment, systemic treatment, you think of chemotherapy, you think of targeted drugs, and you think of blocking the hormones. So I guess a lot of you would have sort of be familiar with some of these names of in terms of chemotherapy drugs. So a lot of them, a lot of you would have had doxorubicin or cyclovir, which is a red color drug you get um, probably a long time ago. Um, so there's a drug called paclitaxel or napaclitaxel or abraxin, or people get docetaxel. Some of you would have had carboplatin. So there's a whole list. And then the trastuzumab and TDM1, this tends to be more people who are HER2 positive disease. Sacituzumab is a new drug which has just come on to Medicare a few months ago for triple negative, and the list sort of goes on. So there's a long, long list of chemotherapy drugs, and the problem is with them is that the majority of them tend to have significant side effects. You know, they're different, but each of them have significant, and over time, it tends to accumulate. So you might have issues with the heart with one drug, you might have neuropathy with another drug, so, and the problem accumulates over time. So if I just have to pick the large category, so it's people that have cancer is driven by estrogen, which is HER2 negative, sort of the most common subtype that occurs. And I think it's best to try and use endocrine therapy. So if you can avoid chemotherapy, that would be ideal. And I think you'd sort of reserve chemo people who have, you know, the resistant disease or they've, they've got lots and lots of disease, you want a quick response. Um, so visceral crisis means, let's say somebody's got bucket load of disease in the liver, and you need to get a quick response to bring the liver disease down, then you would use chemotherapy. Otherwise, there's no real logic of using chemo otherwise. So again, that's your main hormone-blocking tablets, so tamoxifen, the three main drugs in the middle, letrozole, tamoxifen, and aromacin, and a full western, which came on to Medicare about a year and a bit ago. So the majority of side effects tend to be because you're blocking the estrogen, so that's why you tend to get side effects because of that. Uh, tamoxifen also has a risk of clots, can affect the eyes, and the letrozole tends to affect osteoporosis. Um, so for most people across, at least across Australia, if not the rest of the world, will end up getting um, a blockade of aromatism, which is letrozole or, an, uh, or, let, or anastrozole along with what they call as a CD4-6 inhibitor. 
So these are again tablets which block. So I've just tried to draw a diagram, but it sort of blocks the cycle further down in the estrogen blockade. So there's survival benefit as well as progression fees. And that's the three main drugs available. Um, some of you might be familiar with that. Now, of the three drugs, you can pick any of them you like. It depends on what side effects you prefer. <laughs> That's the problem. It, it's a discussion about side effects. <laughs> but but off, off, the, off the lot, the ribocyclib is the only one that actually shows survival benefit, which only ca data only came back a few months ago. So I guess people would probably shift more towards that. Um, but otherwise, the three of them are fairly similar in terms of the mechanism of action. Uh, so for men with metastatic disease, again, I think uh, tamoxifen works well. If you're going to use an aromatase, which is letrozole or, uh, or uh, Arimidex or anastrozole, you've got to use it once you block the, est uh, the testosterone because that sort of also tends to fuel the same cancer. Um, and I think the idea is to avoid testosterone and androgen supplements. Um, saying that, I've got a gentleman who who's on treatment and it's just was driving him mad. So he's actually on testosterone replacement because in his case, it was just too hard to live life. So, you know, I know it sounds terrible, but that's what you've got to do, what you've got to do. Um, now, a lot of people who are on hormone blockade, at some point in time, the cancer tends to grow. And one of the commonest, commonest mutations occurs something called ESR1 or estrogen receptor 1. Uh, and I think that tends to account for nearly about sort of a third to half the mutations are because of this. Um, and all of your normal hormone blockers will not work on these. So there are studies, or there are drugs available on studies we can get access to overcome them. So if you look at the HER2 positive blockade, um, so the commonest ones, you end up using trastuzumab or Herceptin, along with a drug called Pertuzumab or Pajeta, and you have to combine that with a taxane, so Paclitaxel or Docetaxel. Um, and again, the pack exercise tends to be done every week. Those exercises are done every three weeks. And the once you sort of give that initially, then the Herceptin and the Pajeta just keep going, ongoing every sort of three month, three weeks or so. Um, if somebody's got estrogen-driven cancer, the idea is to give the initial chemo, then stop and just use Herceptin with a hormone-blocking tablet, and you can stay on that long term. I think for anyone who's got advanced, it's, it's worth thinking of getting a port put in. Um, if, if you're going to have chemo long term, it's crazy to get poked on our fingers or your arm every time. Just get a port put in. Uh, this is what tends to be used second line, a drug called TDM1 or Kitzyla that's on Medicare. Um, so essentially what these drugs are, they're completely new class of drugs. So if you think of, if you think of Herceptin, uh, if you think of Herceptin as a molecule, so what this does, it actually has a chemo drug inside the Herceptin drug. So it goes into the HER2 cell from the inside and opens it up. So it's almost like a Trojan horse which goes inside and works better. Um, so, so that's what is available as of now on Medicare. Um, but there was a study which came out sort of a few months ago which sort of shows, look, that's the benefit of this new drug. So, so there's a drug called NHER2 um, or trastuzumab of dextrusin. So this will, there is a free access program available but it's still come out to Medicare pretty soon because the difference this versus even Ketzyla is just crazy different. So there's no logic to use the other one when you get access to this. So I, I really think this will be the new standard of care. A lot of people with HER2 disease end up getting brain meds. Um, and I think it's important to try and treat that early on. And I think majority of studies tend to exclude people from brain meds just because they wanted the best possible cohort of people. But I think what we tend to do is we still push them for surgical resection, uh, or you can go and just zap specific spots. So it's SRS is stereotactic radio surgery. So you can give high dose radiotherapy and just burn those specific spots off, or they can give whole brain radiotherapy. So depending on what the extent of disease is. Now, triple negative breast cancers, uh, they're about sort of um, 15 to 20% of all breast cancers, and they tend to be associated with disease other parts of the body. So like for example, a lot of the estrogen positive disease tends to go into the bones, but this tends to go into the liver or the, um, or the lungs. Uh, and I think it's important to test for a germline BRCA mutation um, because they tend to have a higher proportion in, in them. Um, also, it's important to check for something called a PDL one 
Uh, so PDL1 is programmed death ligand one. So people who have PDL1 expression probably will benefit from immune therapy versus people who don't. Um, now I spoke about this low HER2. That drug I spoke about NHER2, the the new HER2 positive drug. That seems to work. Doesn't matter what the HER2 level is, whether it's HER2 high, HER2 low. Doesn't matter. It seems to work for everyone. Um, so that might also come into this sphere fairly soon. So problem is chemotherapy is really the only real option in this case. And I think if you have to give one line of chemotherapy and then you can possibly get onto this new drug called sasituzumab or Trodelvi. Um, Sassy came on to Medicaid just a few months ago. And again, it's one of those new drugs which goes and specifically targets the triple negative breast cancer cells. So it's interesting in that respect. Um, and again, immunotherapy is sort of coming in and I suspect it'll come on to Medicare sort of in the next few months. Um, radiotherapy, I think I tend to reserve radiotherapy mainly for symptomatic spots. So somebody's got a sore back or they've got a, the, uh, something on the shoulder, just go and zap those spots specifically. Similarly, so something happening in, in the brain, either cut it out or burn it out. Now, bone disease tends to be a problem in the sense that it causes pain, affects your quality of life, you know, affects performance. So I think it's important to treat that. So because the biggest risk is end up getting a fracture, sort of mainly if it's in the pelvis or the or, or, or the thigh or the um, the legs. So I think you either get operated or you give radiotherapy and sort of support that. Um, also sometimes the bone. So if you think of a long bone, there's something in it which is sort of eroding it off. So the calcium from the bone comes out onto the blood and pushes the calcium up in the blood. So I think if the calcium side, it's important to treat that too. Um, so I tend to use denosumab or Xgiva, which I guess some of you probably are on. So it's it's similar to Prolia, which is used for osteoporosis. Prolia sort of 60 milligrams once every six months. This is 120 milligrams every month or every two months. And it's important to do it on a regular basis. Um, remember, you must get a dental check done before you start. Or if you're getting teeth pulled out or something operative, don't get your injection because it can affect your jaw significantly. Um, also, what this drug does, so you can take you can take as much calcium or vitamin D you want. What you need is something which is going to take the calcium from the blood and stick it back on the bones, which is what this does. So it makes the bones stronger. Uh, genetic testing, I think, um, so we sort of talk about mainly about people who have early stage disease. I think it's important to also check for people with late stage disease. Um, because it not just does affect them, but also the kids and their brothers and sisters. And also, I think there's there's reasons to sort of test for these two, mainly for BRCA, because pretty soon there's going to be drugs available on Medicare which will target these specifically. Something called PARP inhibitor, there's a drug called Oliparib, which will come on to Medicare hopefully soon. So, in terms of adverse effects of chemotherapy, um, I'm sorry, the slides have sort of all got a bit shifted, but uh, I think the things you get concerned about is extra visation. So the drug comes out of the vein. If you've got a port or a pick line, you don't have to worry about that ever. Um, issues with nausea or vomiting. Um, people can have allergic reactions to chemotherapy. You can have febrile neutropenia where the counts drop and people get an infection um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so for nausea, I sort of tend to use steroids. Um, I think a lot of you use, probably use Maxillon or Domperidome. Uh, this sort of mainly the chemo setting. Um, I tend to use quite a bit of lorazepam. So lorazepam is like a cousin of Valium, but it's not for sleep, it's more for reducing, it, it causes anti-nausea effect. And olanzapine is probably the single best drug for nausea. Now it's not funded in Australia for nausea, it's funded for people with bipolar and schizophrenia and the rest of it, but it's probably the single best anti-nausea drug. It's not expensive, it's worth buying. it. Uh, people can get diarrhea, so more so for capecitabine because I guess with metastatic disease, people are mainly with triple negative disease, they go on to capecitabine tablets and that can cause diarrhea. So it's worth using loperamide so you can keep the dose intensity going. But if it's causing lots of problems, just stop the chemo tablet, and it'll, it'll reverse it automatically. Um, a lot of people would have had chemo early on and they would have had packlets, they get numbness and tingling in the fingers or the toes. And when you're getting more chemo, it can affect it even worse now. So just something worth thinking about because the dose might need to be altered or stopped. Um, some people get mucositis. And again, it could be something as simple as just getting your dentures better sorted out. Using a soft toothbrush as better oral hygiene. 
there is a you know there's a lot of mouthwashes but there, there's a there's a hospital in in Melbourne called the Peter McCallum Hospital their pharmacy pharmacy actually makes something called Peter Mac mouthwash and no pharmacy will stock it but if you ask them they'll give it it's probably the single best thing um so we've got I've managed to get our pharmacy to keep a stock of it but that's probably the I don't know exactly you know what they put in but it works quite well um similarly what we do is so if somebody's got quite a bad of bad mucositis I tend to use lignocaine viscous lignocaine along with nucane gel or gaviscon mix it up we just call it pink lady because that's what the color ends up being so I just tell the nurse can you give pink lady that it seems to work extremely well for that uh when you run chemotherapy we tend to give quite a lot of steroids so sugars go up quite high for the first day or two or three and then it clears off again um so just something to be careful of or wary about because if you go back to your gp just sort of say you know i might need control for those three or four days and then it clears off um a lot of people will have picks or ports and they on treatment long term so they end up getting clots whether it's clots in the legs or they get clots in the lungs is important to get it treated as soon as possible so whether it's injections or you can get oral anti anti blood thinners nowadays so that works just as well for people on cape side been occasionally you can get hand foot syndrome where the fingertips and the toes get sore not numb but sore and treatment is stop the tablets it will correct itself within about 3 or 4 days you just got to recognize it and 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 do something about it um so immune therapy is this whole new class of drugs that have come through now uh, which sort of seem to essentially take the normal immune system of the body and use it to fight cancers or whatever it is so that's the new so that's a cartoon of what it looks like um so in terms of the upper part of the normal immune system and the second bit is the bits where how the cancer sort of controlled the yellow bit which comes in the middle is the new class of drugs so there's pembrolizumab keytruda or optivo that's the new drugs the sort of team tend to work so some of the concerns which um are sort of common so people can have heart failure so if you've had doxorubicin long time ago at full dose so you can only give a certain dose in a lifetime um so if that exceeds or you get close to it, it can cause issues with the heart so that's something to to remember lymphedema i think there was a lot of discussion about this morning um so important to sort of think about that um and i guess for for men with breast cancer there is no difference in availability to drugs everything is on medicare the same as what a lady would get so there's no difference in that respect um but again there's lots of issues with i guess most of people in in country towns um and i think it's important to get your gp or your specialist to sign off on the pads from every time you go and you can get one of those multi trip forms you don't have to sign just one place to sign off multiple things but it's good but at least you can get your travel sorted out up front it's not a financial hit for you um now one of the things i remember a few years ago i'd gone to vakri and one of my patients from there he was a uh, one of those local you know the guy who knows everyone sort of a thing so he he was on treatment with me and he 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 really struggled with getting support in berry and vakri so we ended up so i went there a couple of times up to vakri and they set up a support group just of the locals from there mainly people from the footy club who sort of set up a, a group then it was just that if anybody from the area had cancer they could just contact them more things like you know how do you get transport to adelaide and how do you contact so and so and those sort of practical questions so that might be something worth that you guys might want to think about doesn't have to be breast cancer specific just a cancer support group for people to contact and you know you can help out so many more people um i tend to encourage people to work while they're treatment. if they want to work if people don't want to work i'm happy to sign off and say that you know they can't go back to work but if somebody wants to work quite happy to keep because the whole idea is that once you get over the shock of this whole diagnosis and everything else the hope is over the next few weeks or months as things get better you can go back to some element of normality and i think going back to work even part time is quite good for everyone's mental health not just the person but also their family so i think it's good to get all that sorted out i'm going to just jump in here to right here i i think um for people who are living with metastatic breast cancer you'll be able to resonate with a lot of those mm. side effects or treatments or subtypes for some others in the room it might seem to be very very overwhelming and i suppose from your perspective you don't get all those side effects right up front are you so you're covering off you know what's possible and i think what we want to make mention of too is that 
there's so many new drugs coming down the pipeline, isn't there? And and just wanted to make mention of some of these things that you've talked about because I'm, I'm cognizant that there's different people in the room and sometimes looking at all those side effects for subtypes can be completely overwhelming. But I, th I think the important bit is not so much to scale, but it's important bit to say that these are problems that can occur. Recognize them and complain. Like, don't just live with them and suffer. You've got to complain about them because somebody can the fix question, them. Isn't it? Yes, Talk yeah, up. correct. Yeah. I think that's important to do. Um, so I think from um, when you're coming into one of the chemo day centers, whether it's at Port Lincoln or it's at, at the Adelaide or wherever you sort of go in. I think the majority of the nurses in the day center really support you with uh, different things, so whether it's transport or whatever else. But I think one of the things that at least, I don't know what's in Port Lincoln, but in Adelaide, we struggle to get people to an emergency just because it's a nightmare. You sort of wait in emergency for hours to get something done. So what we tend to do is everyone gets a phone number to call upon and you try and bypass emergencies so coming to the hospital directly or coming to clinic and try and sort things out. So at least you can prevent that trauma of being stuck in hospital. Um, counseling services, so I tend to try and get people to get their GP to do a mental health care plan and we get a psychologist involved early on. Not because everyone has an issue, but it's, I think it's good to bounce it off somebody else and get good feedback and get ways to cope with everything. Um, there's lots of support groups available, but I think it's a question we're trying to navigate who do you get and how do you get, um, and, and most times your local breast care nurse is an excellent resource who can help you out, but most times the chemo nurses in the day center would help you out with a lot of these things too. Um, so I think it's important to keep pain under control. A lot of people have issues with alopecia, so it's good to try and get a good wig if you wanted to. And most places you can actually get a wig voucher so you, you can cut back on, get a rebate on the cost for the same. Um, it's important about contraception because it'll be, it's a problem getting pregnant when you're on chemotherapy. Um, and I think it's important to try and have good concept for the entire time. Um, there's issues with you know anxiety and depression, what's gonna happen to me tomorrow. But I think that that's why getting a psychologist early on would, would probably help you significantly. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that probably the single most important person is your GP. Uh, and I think that the biggest problem is nowadays we can't get a constant GP, unfortunately, because of various reasons. It used to be somebody who's sort of known the GP for 20 years or 30 years. Now I think that's a lot harder to do, uh, not just here, but same in, in, in big cities. So I think, but your GP still remains the single most important because everyone just feeds into the GP and the GP remains your primary doctor. Um, it's good to get community palliative care supports early on, not because somebody's, something's gonna happen to someone early on, but the amount of extra resources which the community palliative care nurse can get is quite astounding. Um, so I think it's good to try and get that early on and discuss about that. Um, and I think it's good to make goals, so whether it's short-term goals or long-term goals, um, not for anything else, but just to try and like you've got to have a reason to do things. So it could just be, I want to make a trip to this place. So you got to work your chemo around that. So like I have a few people who come and tell me, okay, that's it. I'm doing this, 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 this. Now you work around. I've got to try and figure out the chemo around there. All it is. But, but I think that's important because they've got to do what they've got to do. So I think that's important to try and sort out. Uh, so a few of us set up um, a research unit up in Adelaide um, about a year and a half ago, uh, more so to try and get access to newer drugs. And we were struggling to do it um, at some of the public hospitals because of bureaucracy and whatever else. So we sort of set up our own. Um, and I guess the idea for us to try and get access to newer drugs, getting more options for our people. Uh, and I think even if you're going on to a drug which is standard of care, um, because there's so many people looking out for, so they don't know you as a name, they know you as a number, but they'll say, oh, so-and-so has not got a scan done or a blood test and why it's not happened. So they'll chase it up and make sure it happens. So I think that's the advantage of going on to a study. All of the drugs get funded for through the study. It's for public and for private patients. So it doesn't really matter um, what happened in that respect. Um, so we're sort of based at South Terrace. Um, so we do phase two and phase three studies. Um, and we're starting doing phase ones now. So what that usually, uh, what that means, so if, you, if you've got, so phase one means you've done it in dogs and cats and you're moving to humans now. Uh, so that's a phase one, you're, you're looking at drugs which are completely new, 
Most of them won't have a number. They won't have a name. They just have a number. So once you're happy with that, then you go to a phase two, which looks at how efficacious the drug is. Then you move to a phase three, which is comparing to standard. So that's what you go up your chain in terms of what it is. Um, and we're also doing a, a fair bunch of what they call as first in human studies. Um, there's, there's very few sites across Australia which do first in human studies. Um, and we're trying to push more and more for telemedicine conferencing because if you've got you on a tablet-based treatment, there's little logic to come back every week to Adelaide. So if you can do it through video conference, that'll sort of save time and effort. So just trying to look at some of these studies. We have I've not put down, just put down some studies at least for your interest. So for example, estrogen positive studies. So we've got a study called Olima. You remember we spoke about that ESR1 mutation. So this drug specifically works for ESR1 mutant uh, patients who've got that mutation. Similarly, we've got another study, which is, a, again, it's a number, 4551001. So that t tends to work quite well for people who've already had standard hormone blockade treatments for whatever it's worth. A study called M3, again, getting access to a completely different class of drugs. So they're all different. So this, uh, this 4891002 is for people who had, who've just been diagnosed with breast cancer, which is driven by estrogen. So we spoke about that palbocyclib and ribocyclib along with that. So this is a completely new class. So this is first line treatment for them. Um, again, they've agreed for telemedicine conferencing for them. So some people will have what they call as a PIC C3A mutation. So we've got a study for that specifically. So there's presently no drugs available for this mutation. Um, then there's something called a KRA. So just different mutations that are there. Now it sort of sounds crazy to do that, but the thing to remember is that, you know, you've heard of, uh, you, you sort of see people who have estrogen driven cancers ER positive so what are you doing you're targeting the ER you're giving tamoxifen and letrozole because you're targeting that mutation similarly somebody's got a HER2 mutation you're targeting them with Herceptin or Trastuzumab because you're targeting them similarly if you can find different mutations that's your best way of treating it instead of giving chemotherapy because all of these don't need chemotherapy uh, for HER2 mutations you've got access to Herceptin Pertuzumab TDM1 and now NHER2. But if you're running out of options there, then there's access to a couple of more drugs. There's a drug called, the study called MTEM. There's a study called HER2 CLIMB. So it gets access to a drug called Tucatinib, just a completely different drug uh, for HER2 mutation disease. Um, and I was talking to somebody earlier about triple negative cancer. So there's about sort of four or five different uh, studies we have for triple negative. So there's a so when you're trying to divide out people into PDL1 positive or PDL1 negative in terms of immune therapy, so people who are PDL1 negative struggle to get access to immune therapy. So like for example, the Gilead study is using a drug called magrolimab, which is for PDL1 negative patients. The Ascent 3, so people who are PDL1 positive, Ascent 4. So there's different options in that respect. These last two studies how people who have had options of all treatments are there, they get pure immune therapy treatments. So there's, so don't ever feel that you don't have options, there's always something more that's there. Um, there's also a sort of few studies which are looking at any solid tumor, so it doesn't matter if it's breast or bowel or lung or whatever else. So they'll have different cohorts of studies in terms of getting access to different drugs in that respect. Um, just a couple of things which are probably different and I'll stop there. So there's something, we, we opened a vaccine study end of last year, so we've got one person on it. So what they do is you take a biopsy of the tumor and you draw blood and that gets sent up. They actually make a vaccine for that person. It takes about four and a half months to make. And so while they're on other treatment and then you can get the vaccine. So the vaccine, it's almost like, you know, when you think of it, you, when you were kids, you got smallpox vaccine and you never get smallpox because the same principle for the use for this. Um, so this is something quite interesting, which we've never sort of, and it's, it's, it's a harder thing to explain to people. You gotta wait for five months. What do you mean five months? I can't wait for five months, but while you're on treatment, they can still get onto this. So that's something which is, I guess, quite different for us. Uh, the other study, which is interesting is something called Suplexa. Um, so what Suplexa is doing is they take about 50 ml of your blood that gets entered, that takes about four or five weeks and they take the immune cells and they put it back into the person. So the immune cells of the person is what fights the cancer. So something quite different. So there's no chemo involved in any of these. So I guess what, you, what I've tried to align is one size approach doesn't work. So it's important to try and ask questions. It's important to try and ask more than what's available and don't sort of ever just feel that's the end of the story. There's lots more to go. Thank you.